illustrious set of people in the panel each one of them a big achiever in their own right not only that have also contributed something to this sector the education sector the learning and related areas so i'm i'm really glad privileged and thank you so much for inviting me over i'm going to keep this short let me start by saying why i believe this sector education if at all you call it a sector they call it by different names why is it interesting for people the first thing i noticed is in the history of mankind no country ever had so many young people and this is increasing the demographic bulge in india is going to be around by some prediction till 2050 could be more depending on how we do the replacement rate but it's going to be there for a very long time and then i realized it is not just the young population i just had some statistics the middle income group or the middle age population which has the most propensity to spend on education which is proven globally we had about 432 million which is about 35% of our population in 2021 goes all the way to 715 million by 2030 and a whooping 1.02 billion by 2047 which is a like 100 so it's like you know you not only going to have young population but also have those who have the propensity to spend more and more and more so we are seeing this sector's revenue i don't know quadruple multiplied by 7 10 whatever so that's one second thing that we also see the market with the industry 4.0 and other things is constantly changing what they want making it clear that uh, it's no more only the youngsters who go through education anybody who thinks uh, they'll do the padai till about 25 30 years and then they can rest or in for a big shock <laughs> and there is a statistic that says anybody born after 2007 has a 97% probability of living more than 100 years so many of the youngsters will have a long that means what they need to have continuous education and industry 4.0 digital technologies have changed what is required on the other hand the employees i mean there is a new term called gig employment and gig employees nobody wants to stick to one job for a long time i now wonder my dad spent 42 years in in one firm one organization nobody can even think of those things nowadays so that means what new talent new skills reskilling upskilling needs to happen continuously there add to it idiosyncrasies of our own country like you know very few quality institutions for a very large number of people the whatever like the preparation for it the examinations for it all of them make it uh, even more attractive from somebody who wants to invest in this sector so in the light of all these things let me start with you akshay because i read recently that us had the maximum number of students from india for the first time beating china there are many reasons for it but then the lure of you know foreign educational institutions is rising continuously but at the same time i also saw this bill that is there that is allowing foreign institutions to come into india what is your take you are in the sector you are like connecting people connecting students what's your take on what's the opportunity in the sector in the space no i first of all thank you and i agree with a lot of things that you spoke about uh, education as the and i'm sure everybody sitting on this panel is missionary first and then they kind of think about business uh, specifically coming to your question about uh, uh, i actually don't treat too much into numbers and the fact that india has surpassed so and so country and they are a larger contingent so and so forth it boils down to just one simple thing which we were very briefly talking about before we got on the stage are you getting an outcome at the end of the program uh us historically has done very well at ensuring an outcome at the end of the program so somebody is able to get a job uh they have a very well designed post study program which is the opt and uh, people have historically done very well in that geography uh and you have people who are in decision making uh, ability within the us federal structure and things like that so i think that's one reason uh, at the same time uh, while i'm very enthusiastic as a patriot that so many of these institutions are choosing to set up campuses in this this university called wolfgang which is uh, set up a campus in gift city in uh, australian university uh, but uh, i think there's still a very long way to go where we can actually give these folks outcomes we have a lot of universities in india that i very deeply respect at that spectrum of uh, 20 lakh rupee to 50 lakh rupee 
uh, there is no commensurate outcome for it except a couple of business schools and they're also kind of uh, slightly slacking there at the moment so till the time we actually can have the right roi delivered against the higher education program that i'm pursuing i think uh, everything else is more like there's, there's nothing very concrete there so people choose to go to a uk and a canada and australia because for about 10 15 20 lakh rupees they get a 30 lakh rupee job and that for them is like a great roi as compared to driving a bike in navi mumbai or whitefield or like say okla so that segment it's very exciting for them to kind of move abroad in the same time for people who are essentially going to spend 50 lakh rupees for a program in india which will get a job in india we need to create those sort of jobs as well to absorb that amount of population so i think there's some time away at the same time indian talent is i'll just end by saying that the indian talent is in top form right now they are able to choose which country they go to so countries are bending their uh, will and their policies to attract the right talent from india and hence you see a post study work visa in the uk uh three year post study work visa in australia compared to two year in uk the opt changes in the us everybody really wants indian talent so that they can also uh fill in that shortfall that they have from a talent perspective as well so oh, thank you so much so nice to hear that actually coming from you who knows what is happening there the demand for indian talent we also observe in the market is only growing Uh, across you know not you know not just professional services firms like us even manufacturing across sectors we see this happening so it's nice to hear that i also wish the other side of that you said the indian institutions get only better and better but there is enough and more runway for you know the foreign education institutions to look at the indian market for that the other thing i also liked in what you said is the returns there is a value that our institutions will learn soon and maybe come up to speed but taking on from there uh if the demand for education is high and mobility of global talent is high so should be the demand for international uh, curriculums and education right from schooling right i also see more and more parents now willing to quote and quote experiment look at alternates what is your view when you run one of the most successful uh, international school chains what is your view in terms of a demand for international curriculum and international education in uh, india so <clears throat> firstly thank you for those kind words and you know i think there's massive demand for international education i think over the last decade we've been seeing a growth spurt in uh, international schools that have been coming up initially it was in the metros we are now seeing them even in the tier 1 tier 2 cities and i can rattle off some numbers and tell you so many international schools came up in the last 3 years 5 years 7 years but i think i look at this slightly differently sir for me the international part of the education and if i'm if i may just take 2 minutes to break this up when we look at schools when we look at curriculum there are two parts to it one is the what and the other is the how so the what is what you teach what is the curriculum what is the syllabus as we used to call it when we all were in school the how is what is the focus what is the methodology what is the actual learning outcome of education so the real growth today why are international schools doing really well because they have made education relevant learners are learning skills focusing on values focusing on certain things that every school feels is necessary to make them relevant 10 years 15 years from now when we don't know what jobs will exist what jobs would have been replaced what skills will be required today if they have to compete with a machine if you and me have to compete with a machine we can't win we will make a mistake the machine won't but there are certain skills like communication entrepreneurship uh, there are certain values like respect humility honesty i think if we are able to teach them that and get them through that phase of education and give them the right skills and the right values that irrespective of how the world is 5 years 10 years 15 years from now they can thrive and they can compete i think that's what's made international education really popular you know today it's not about 
what date did a certain event happen in history or who was responsible for it or which location it happened because information is available at a click of a button the real question is what impact did that event have today if you're looking at the dandi march it's about what impact did the dandi march have what impact did, did gandhi ji have to us as a nation and i think that's what today's learners today's kids have to learn so when i said the growth of international education yes there is a lot of growth there's a lot of opportunity lots of international schools will come up but i think the real growth will come when schools that are not necessarily following international curriculums can adapt and adopt the best practices from international education irrespective of whether you're running a state run school or national run school or a international school use those in their teaching methodologies in their assessment patterns today i think mental math is really important so it's important to learn your five times six times seven times table but it's not important to assess them on saying what is 5 into 8 and 6 into 7 it's more as a skill for memory for logical thinking so if the reason why you're doing it is right and that's what a lot of international schools have been able to adapt then the real growth comes with the impact international education can have and just going by what you said sir the population is only growing the number of kids that are going to come into education are more and more and more so to make them relevant to make sure that they are relevant and successful till the age of 100 is the job that we have to focus on so for me i think it's the impact that international schools can have the program adapting the best practices in all the schools in india or in as many schools in india as we can and i think that's where the real growth story is very well said kunal very very well said so it's not just some esoteric curriculum that is making the difference but it is the how part of it and most importantly i like the way you said the curriculum kind of teaches you to learn more and be ready for the future and not just certain technical subjects as a part of it yeah like today i think getting information is not a problem channelizing the information and being able to analyze it and use it in the right way wonderful is is the key right excellent so internationalization is more on the process and the methodology rather than just the curriculum very well said sago i'm not going to turn to you all nice things said about internationalization international schools but it is our traditional schools that have created this buzz if today there are we are world beaters and the world wants our talent it is because of traditional schools that have created this talent and you represent one of the most prominent and the most well known brand in schools how do you see this trend happening like how do you see um, uh, a technology that is coming to disrupt an internationalization that is coming to disrupt the existing way of working and how do you see uh, the traditional schools reacting to it sure thank you so much for that question narayanan and thank you for setting the tone um, since we are still having a cricketing fever or cricketing hangover going on you're the rohit sharma for setting the tone in this graveyard shift of the afternoon so thank you for setting the platform um but to your question about this disruption of whether it's technology or interna internationalization which are two different things by the way um technology with this latest you know everyone's trying to run behind these buzzwords we were in education conferences say before the pandemic and at that time people would be talking about um you know having these google meet kind of uh, virtual learnings and nobody thought it was possible and yet the pandemic showed all schools that that is exactly how you'll have to manage at least for those one and a half two years um and now everyone's talking about ai vr ar mr xr etc etc now in these fancy buzzwords have we somewhere lost the woods for the trees um now it's not a question of if but when at least some of these technologies will become mainstream in education whether inside classrooms or outside classrooms at homes but the fundamental question still lies is in are we serving the purpose of education getting children ready with the life skills that they will require to tackle all of those challenges head on when they have to hit them 
Yet, we live in a country that is anachronistic in its education system, where what should parents be sending their children to schools for, so that they can maximize their inherent talents, excel at what they are best in. Yet, when you actually go to the writing board and check what are parents sending their children to schools for, so that they can get the best marks. At the end of the day, a lot of Indian education is revolving around this unhealthy pursuit of marks. What do the marks measure? For a very large part, and I would go so far to say that even international schools and traditional and national and state boards have this pursuit of marks in a different manner, in a different way, where the marks measure rote memorization, regurgitation. Yes, interna international schools do have a little bit more of subjectivity in seeing how the child is thinking about an answer rather than just that one right answer. But you can have only so much subjectivity if you want a final pen and paper test or a final MCQ test. At the end of the day, assessments itself, if it's only measuring marks, which is measuring memorization, regurgitation, and then we as education heads, trustees, wish that our children are actually being brought up with skills like communication, uh, critical thinking, resilience, the ability to cope with limited resources, all of these things, which of these skills do our tests measure? And if we, as education heads, do start measuring that, to the, Akshay was talking about the outcome. At the university level, the outcome is the final job that you get. What package do you get? At K-12, what is the outcome? Is it the number of marks that you get? Unfortunately, yes. Today it is. Which college did I get into for my 11th, 12th? Or which college did I get into for my after 11th, 12th, for my undergrad? If that is going to measure rote memorization and regurgitation, then at the end of the day, we are still going around in the same circles that what many of us learned in the 80s and 90s. So, I think a soul searching needs to be done, whether it is through technology or whether it's the international of education, of how will we be able to assess and truly measure and get the parents to actually desire to want those skills that the children should be brought up with rather than us throwing it down their throat that no, these are the important skills. This is what your child should learn. Yes, they should learn that. But at the end of the day, if the, if the college is not going to give them admission on that, but going to give them admission on Achha, beta, science mein kitne, kitne hai, maths mein kitne number hai. If that is what it's going to boil down to, then I think we're barking up the wrong tree. But do you think things are changing? Absolutely. I think things are changing, but unfortunately, it's a very slow process. And when I say things are changing, I'll tell you this, not only in terms of education circles and people who are running schools, but even the CBSEs and the ICSEs are changing. You go to conferences where they are speaking and they are also speaking these same things. But let's not forget that CBSE has 22,000 schools. And of those 22,000 schools, maybe not even 5% of those will be in conferences like this. 95% of those are in the hinterland of India who don't really see these things as requirements. So even if CBSE does try to push this, can they truly push it down to the top floor level? to those 22,000 schools. Those are challenges that they have, which the other side generally doesn't see. I understand. It's a bit of chicken and egg because when I speak to... Uh, <laughs> no, in fact, it's a bit of chicken and egg because when you meet parents, they say, uh, the schools don't offer this and you talk to schools, they say the parents don't request or look for these things. But somewhere it is changing, but you're not happy with the pace of change. Like, you know, it has to... And also the change with all the stakeholders concerned should come in. Fantastic. Mithan, definitely not the least, like, you know, I want to ask you, see, these changes, many things that we all spoke are all happening in urban India, things are changing a lot, and we see distinct changes happening also in certain curriculum, schools, assessment, and other things. But in the hinterland, do you think anything is changing at all? One. And for those who want to invest in the sector, do you think there is anything attractive to go beyond the metros? Okay, so I think, uh, you know, both my colleagues here shared some numbers, right? So if I add, I, I build on to what Raghav was saying, there are, uh, you know, there are 280 million school-going children. Uh, 
entrepreneurs like Kunal, Raghav and the great school chains reach out to maybe 3 million max if I like stretch my imagination. Yeah, 3 million, 4 million out of 280 million kids. And you know, as you, as, as you were mentioning earlier, Narayanan, uh, you know, the, the next five countries, kids in the K-12 age group, next five countries put together is the size of India. Like China, US, and you know, a, a couple of more uh, Southeast Asian countries. Now, these kids, half of them are going to government schools and half of them are going to private schools. So there are 450,000 private schools. CBSC reaches 22,000. So who are the rest? They're all state board schools. That's where our kids are going. Uh, now, if I connect it to the question that you're asking, right, that uh, I think the beauty of India is that uh, all these parents are aspiring for a great education. What does great education mean to them? Even though the parents are uneducated, they get that great education means my child should be able to apply the learning in life. You talk to a farmer who sends his child to my school, you know, his, his dialogue actually to one of my investors was, Sir, kitabi gyan or sahi gyan ke beech mein difference pata hai humko. Hum padhe likhe nahi hai. You know, like I know the difference between bookish and rote learning and real learning. Uh, so they know that. They also aspire for their kids to be proficient with English language so that the kids can get higher education in India or outside because unfortunately we don't have IITs that are running in vernacular languages. We don't have all of the top institutions are in English language, right? So I think now one can see this as a problem. I choose to see it as an opportunity. When there is a population of people who aspire for big things, and for their children, well then that's where all of us come into the picture where we have to bring innovative solutions to these schools for them to be able to uplift learning outcomes. So do I see hope? I see hope all around because of the fact that you have a paying parent. Uh, you know, and I, I, I actually would love to also take another analogy. Uh, when I talk to investors, particularly, you know, one question that I get asked is, oh, do, does this parent segment even have enough disposable income? Guess what? You, you don't look at these households from a disposable income point of view. Most of the parents who are sending their children to affordable or low-income schools are borrowing. And if there is good, borrow, if there are good credit options for them, which is, I think, shifted in the last 10 years. The number of NBFCs who are able to lend to these families uh, is, you know, what is it unlocking for them? It is unlocking education for their children because they see the education of their child as an investment to their family's income to grow. Uh, so, you know, this is not about disposable income for them. These are the families who will borrow money to send their children to great schools. So I think that opportunity exists. It is now really for all of us uh, to see, can we bring that innovation? Uh, can we uplift these schools from the rote learning that they were doing, irrespective of what the board says, uh, you know, and, and actually take them forward? You know, there are, there's, there's a great thing about these boards and there is also an opportunity again, right? Like, yeah, boards are testing, as Raghav was saying, rightfully, they are testing for rote learning. But the good thing is they only test for grade 10. And there is this freedom that the private schools have to decide what they do with their kids, at least till grade eight. You know, the way we design curriculum is, let's look at what the international schools are doing. Our parents are not going to be able to afford that uh, education. Can I, you know, both from the what and the how, as Kunal was saying, can I learn from that? And can I basically bring it to all of these children uh, and really prepare them for the future? Until eighth standard, no one will ask me a question. It is only for the school owner and the parent to decide that, hey, this is the right thing for my kids. And many of them are taking that leap. And then nine, tenth, well, cram and get past the board exam. Kids who are smart and who have the thinking ability, communication skills, uh, collaboration skills, can ace any sort of examination, right? So, so I think, see, my, my view on this is the ecosystem is going to change. The regulatory ecosystem is going to change. NEP is a great step in that direction. You know, when I read the NEP document, my first uh, observation was whoever has written the document has finally understood what IB is trying to do. Because it's pretty much borrowed from IB, which is great for our country. Uh, but in, you know, realistically speaking, uh, the government is, could, is going to take a long time to implement it. It's been five years, I haven't seen much movement. State governments are even way behind CBSC. So it's a long journey. We don't have to wait. People like us can actually bring up a lot of innovative solutions. Parents and schools are ready to 
lap it up we're ready to lap it up it's really in our in our hands uh, thanks mita wonderful i mean just a point on nep uh, we worked with different countries the pace at which things change in education is very long like you know we talk a lot about fin finish education it took 30 long years for them to change you know it started in mid 70s and only recently they are known for that so i guess nep will take time but i like the point that you said you know you you you, you need not change the world or you need not keep waiting for everything to change uh, like i said i like the theory of constraints let them remain where they are in whatever possible we can can we change and can we look at this to improve ours that's the beauty of this democracy right the fact that india government allows for private schools to thrive means that now the power is with the parents and as long as that power is there well the parents are willing to pay and the parents do aspire for a lot for their kids so there is a big opportunity uh, on the nep comment i mean if we compare versus the countries which are amongst the top ranked pisa countries well the pace at which india is trying to implement nep i mean my humble submission would be we are just too slow if finland took 30 years and singapore took 30 years the rate at which we are going will take 60 so i honestly feel that there is a lot more that needs to happen uh, and uh, I, i think one of the things that uh, you know structurally has to open up in india is that the government bodies and organizations have to see private players who've already done quite a bit of that i mean if you see international schools for the last 15 years have been doing what nep is talking about i mean my i put my kid and she's 15 years old and she's in an international school she's an indian she's born here and you know if she can get it why not others uh, i think the it will be great if the government partners with the private sector with you know people like uh, konal and raghav and there are many other such entrepreneurs if that opens up i think there is there is velocity that can come in uh, and you know if there are any government officials listening that's my humble request to all of them that hey we we are in this together we have to solve this problem together government alone can't solve it private sector alone can't solve it i agree but as you also rightly said the bulk of it is in state boards bulk of it is in public schools so when you're talking about large scale change private bulk sector changing schools are state boards sorry bulk of schools are state boards bulk of kids are in both places and if government does not move then the secular trend is for all parents to move their kids to private schools we, that's what's we have, happening we have about 1.6 million schools in the country right now one of the yeah. the highest the world but i take your point somewhere the change needs to happen so this is very very interesting we talked about not just the international curriculum or the ethos or the concept of international curriculum and how we can follow and also the angst that you know the current way we are doing things for historical reasons is not leading us to the right direction and also how we can you know work around that and still make things happen so i'm also conscious that we are talking about investment in the sector so we have you know many people here who have the money backs to invest in the sector or those who want to enter into the sector for this so i see it in multiple dimensions one as you rightly touched is regulation right does the regulation allow us to get into the sector invest in other things second is money itself financing like you know how do you finance for some of these transformations third in my view is technology and how that can create a difference because i see technology being disruptive in the way it can change things and not wait the long haul and other things last of course the people availability mm -hmm. for this you can't change you see so i just want to understand your perspectives if there is somebody sitting here wanting to invest in the sector what would be your advice what are the areas in which you think from a pure investment mm -hmm. return perspective what could be the areas in which you should be focusing on we start with you yeah so i think it's an interesting question and um it really depends on what your objectives are what your goals are i mean there are people today who are investing into education because they see a quick multiple on it and it's a 5 year or 10 year horizon that i'll buy at x and then i'll sell it at 3x 5x or whatever the multiple might be um if that is what your real true objective and goal is then you're anyways going to be following what the pe firms and all are doing in just investing in pure basic numbers however coming from a group where we are now 97 years old august 1927 was our first school just down the road here in santa cruz and we don't look at education like that education is not an excel spreadsheet with numbers on it it's inside classrooms 
um, education is not a transactional phenomenon. It's a relationship phenomenon that a teacher forms with each and every one of his students. And then those students are your return on investment over 10, 20, 30 years. I met just now somebody who's an alumni at one of my schools and he's been at IIM Ahmedabad and he's going to be speaking on the next panel. And I was so proud to hear that. And what return on investment can you give on that? Beautiful. So you touched a very important point. If you are looking at just pure commercial returns, then you know, watch out. Like, you know, you're going to be disappointed is what you're saying, right? Actually, if I can, I, I would I would have a different take on that, Raghav. And simply, it's a tagline that we use within our organization that uh, in our business, which is true for all of us, Saraswati comes first, Lakshmi follows Saraswati. So, you know, there is a lot of, there are very good commercial outcomes out here. As I was saying, there is big appetite for parents to spend because they aspire. We're an aspiring nation. Uh, there is a lack of good solutions and that is a great, hence, investable opportunity. I think what I at least, see, I've been in this space now for 15 years, right? I think what happened over the last four, five years, at least my observation, Naran, was that we got distracted. We got distracted with B2C at tech. Uh, we got distracted because I think B2C works for a certain age group. And, you know, two things happened. One, we sort of just did the this for that. Oh, this works in China, so it'll work in India. It won't. China is 97% public schools. India is not. It's very different. Well, we've also seen the downside of that, right? So in China, you cannot improve public schools. But in India, that's not true. You have a massive private school opportunity. So there is so much that you can do in that sector because it's an open capital market structure, right? So I think one was that which derailed us. Uh, and the second thing that derailed us was COVID. Because uh, suddenly everyone was like, what works for older kids, which is online, and you know, what works for adult learning works for K-12. Well, all of us who are running, uh, who are running schools or work with schools, we know, and anyone who's a parent in the room knows they don't want their seven-year-old kid to learn online, or even a 10-year-old is not going to learn online. So I think those were the two things that derailed. Now, media can capture this the way it is, but, uh, you know, people in the sector were making some bad choices. I think some sanity has come in. And hence, if you really look at the successful models across the world, uh, institutional B2B ed tech is really the sustainable businesses. They are listed companies. They are actually, they have great returns. They are able to provide commercial returns at the rate at other industries do. Uh, so I, I, think, I, I think it is, you know, to answer your question, well, uh, my, my thing to investors would be, you know, you guys miss the bus maybe, or it happens, we all learn. Uh, but I think now we're in a place where it's fairly crystal clear that if it is K-12, you should be investing in uh, institutional or school ed tech. And if it's higher ed, then well, yes, you know, then, then uh, B2C works because this is an adult who is going to take responsibility for their learning and uh, they want to do it on the go while they're also working. Uh, which is something that I think Aksh, uh, you know, Akshay was also sort of referring to earlier. Wow. In fact, that's, that's <laughs> just, you touched upon a very sensitive kind of the B2B versus B2C that's happening. And you also gave a solution saying, if it is schools, you better go B2B. And if it is higher education, then look at B2C. You know what? There is this concept of where is the margin? Are we really doing well when it comes? And I all, many of my clients I see, the ones who are in B2C always think the grass on the other side is greener, they want to come to B2B. And let me tell you, vice versa. People who are in B2B always think, think the B2C guys are making a lot of money. Thankfully, we didn't, but <laughs> we got advised a lot, but yeah. Your, your, your question is on margins, is it? On, on, yeah. I know, is it, is see, it so think, crystal clear that you need to go only here or is there a middle path? if you path? think about margins, essentially there are two parts to it, right? One part is unit economics. Unit economics are you have to be very clear about the consumer segment you are targeting and you have to build a product solution that makes it affordable for them. There is no, like I, you know, international schools, for example, if I look at that, the, the, the unit economics are not relevant for the affordable segment or the lower segment. They're not relevant. You have to think about it very differently there. I think in B2C, unit economics was less of a problem in K-12. Uh, higher education, I don't know much about. I think the, the, the second cog in that wheel is CAC. You know, when you reach a school, you've reached a community. And once you're with the school, you are impacting that community in many ways. But if you're doing B2C, you're reaching out to every single student. 
And I think that's where my understanding is that the business models broke down. So there is a lot of money to be made, as I said. Uh, but different projections were made five years back, you know. So, and the I'm cost so of sorry to interrupt. Sir, could we keep that as a final thoughts? Could we go for a final thoughts as we are running short on time? Just oh. a final thoughts on the panel sure, would be great. Sure, sure. Sorry, yeah. So then um, let me just quickly add one thing in the whole investment part that you, uh, you know, asked about. I think all relevant points here. But I think people who are looking to invest in education... Uh, have to consider the entire government intervention and the government rules, regulations, policies. They're very different for different sectors within education. So K through 12 is very different. Higher education is very different. Uh, there are a lot of unregulated sectors, which makes investments a lot easier. So just in the interest of time, what I'd like to share is that it's really important for an investor to understand the government repercussions, the government, uh, you know, what are the kind of interventions that they can have in that micro space within education? Because if you don't understand that, uh, you know, you've heard of stories that could go horribly wrong and then you don't want that. You'll repent at leisure. You don't want that. Just to kind of answer the same question and take a cue. First of all, let me say that when Raghav said 3 to 5x multiple, it almost broke my heart a little. But, uh, and, you, and you said it's exciting, so that broke my heart a little bit more. But uh, I think it has to be just looked at from a very, I think education is also a very complex business to fund and measure. Uh, we are in some sense B2B2C. And when I think about the challenges with B2B2C, we often look at uh, the fact that does profitability really count? Like I'm very envious of people who run school and university chains because uh, at a certain volume, it's a massive cash generating business. And you actually start piling cash. Uh, you don't have uh, massive working capital cycles as are seen in my business. Mm -hmm. uh, does profitability count or does free cash flow really count? Uh, has the education investment landscape become mature enough to value a company mm -hmm. on free cash flows that even if a business is starting to generate free cash flow and even if it is minimal, they're on that path to essentially build a very large business in the next three, five, seven years. So I think the investment mm -hmm. landscape has to mature up over the next five years for them to really... I kind of really agree with the larger point Smita was making that. Uh, and just one example in terms of like my business, we have seen if people really are getting the outcomes, they will do anything to get there. Uh, we have seen uh, in, in Punjab, the government has introduced IELTS classes in public schools, government schools. So English language learning has become so important that, and by the way, we see 38% students drop off and they're not able to go and study abroad because... Uh, their conditional offer letter does not become an unconditional offer letter because they don't classify their English language learning, IELTS, SOFIL, PT, whatever that be. So we have seen that the government is actually is so uh, energetic about it that they introduced that in government schools and they're saying the IELTS here and then essentially be able to do this. So uh, the right entrepreneurs and the right systems, private systems more specifically, will come in and be able to uh, do things which really result into, I'm again emphasizing the right outcomes. And the investment system will have to actually, of course, mature up over the next three, four years. Either which way we see, we see a large opportunity. Like, you know, in whichever sector we see. But that word of caution is actually very valid. It is a regulated sector. It is in a lot of sense like government has control over it. So watch out for some of those. This has been wonderful. I know we are running out of time. But let me tell you something. I learned so much in this conversation. It is almost like a master class on, you know, investment into the sector. A lot of takeaways, the lack of time, I'm not summarizing, I was planning to do. <laughs> no but thank you so much for being such lovely panelists and sharing all your, uh, you know, the, the learnings that you had over so many years of your experience. In this. Thank you so much.